Um, and so as we're going to pick up where we left off, you'll remember we left at just the very end of chapter 10 of 2 Corinthians. We have been in this study. This is our 16th week, and uh, we're just moving forward as, as, as we can and as uh, the snow allows. So thankfully, uh, those of you who made it here, uh, the Frozen Chosen, thank you for braving the elements. And for those of you at home, you may have had the better gig. We'll see. Uh, but either way, th- what we come together for is not to, not to learn information, but we are learning about God with the purpose of being transformed and ultimately to get to know him better. And so hopefully, I know even as I come into this time and I've got all sorts of thoughts, I know where we're going, but even then, it's like, man, I really want our hearts to be focused on God speaking through his word as his Holy Spirit applies it to our hearts. So here's the crazy thing. Paul wrote this letter like, man, forever ago, 2,000 years ago, roughly. And the awesome power of God that he moves through his word in such a way that it is fresh, that it is new, that it applies to our lives. Uh, Paul's going to use some analogies and some metaphors that are going to be challenging, but I think the, the more we understand them as we get into chapter 11, the more we're going to see God's focus, and especially tonight, because you know what we're going to be talking about if you've been following us. Um, he's talking about those false apostles, which he's going to call tonight super apostles, and he says so in a very snarky way because they're not super apostles. Um, but he's really going to dig into tonight what it means to have good doctrine and the importance of good theology. So if those words you're like, oh, doctrine and theology, Please, if you've read anything from Paul, he stresses the importance time and time again of knowing God accurately, knowing who he is. And whenever you distort the word of God or you distort the gospel, you're, you're messing with the integrity of scripture and you're messing with the very character of God. And to know him falsely because of bad teaching is literally one of those things that's like right up there with the impardonable sin. If you're teaching false doctrine, especially at the level of the gospel, you're in trouble. And so you're gonna see they're gonna do that tonight. He's gonna use some really good comparisons to help us better understand. Before we get too far into it though, here's what I wanna do. Same thing, you know where we're going if you've been with us for a while. We gotta pray, do the most important thing we do tonight and and ask for God to not only open our hearts to his truth, but to apply it in such a way that we leave here changed. That's our desire, right? So no matter where we're coming from tonight, we want to leave here differently than when we came in. So let's, let's ask God to do that, and then we'll dig into his word tonight. Father God, thank you for you. Thank you for an opportunity to, to take a section of our time and to focus on you. And I pray, God, because I know even for myself that the, our tendency towards distraction and even our tendency to think about things that weigh heavy on our heart during this time will be great. And so we don't want to ignore the circumstances going on around us, but instead we ask, Father, that you would speak through your word in a way that integrates where we are and helps us to better understand who you are. Father, our joy, our delight, our pleasure is found in knowing you. Not not just the, the, the many blessings that you have given us, not just being able to sit in comfortable chairs and being able to have heat and all of those blessings are amazing and we thank you, but it is knowing you, knowing you above all things, knowing you that we are known and loved and forgiven through faith in Jesus and all of those things, all of those blessings are ours in you. So thank you, Father, for what you have done. Thank you for what you are doing in our lives to transform us and shape us more and more every day into the image of your son, Jesus. And when we do that, when we step into the life that you've offered us by following you, by loving you, God, we really do experience more and more of life and life to the full. And so we pray that you would be in this place, that you would allow us, Father, to know you more and that you would speak to our hearts, that you might be glorified. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open those up. We'll be in 2 Corinthians and we'll be starting in chapter 11. You know, we just finished 10 last week and we're gonna be going through verses one through 15. So what we've gotten in the habit of doing is reading those, all the, reading the whole section just so you can get an idea of the entire section and then we'll pull it apart to understand more and more of what Paul is talking about. So we'll read it all the way through starting in verse one. I hope you will put up with me in a little foolishness. That's just fantastic. I know I'm not supposed to start, stop right there, but he's like, let me be foolish. And so just know that what you're going to hear is him being foolish. And we'll talk about what that foolishness looks like. Yes, please put up with me. I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. I promised you to one husband, to Christ, so that I might present you as a pure virgin to him. But I am afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes to you and preaches a Jesus other than the Jesus we preached, or if you receive a different spirit from the spirit you received, or a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it easily enough. I do not think I am in the least inferior to these super apostles. I may indeed be be untrained as a speaker, but I do have knowledge. We have made this perfectly clear to you in every way. Was it a sin for me to lower myself in order to elevate you by preaching the gospel of God to you free of charge? I robbed other churches by receiving support from them so as to serve you. And when I was with you and needed something, I was not a burden to anyone, but the brothers who came from Macedonia supplied what I needed. I have kept myself from being a burden to you in any way and will continue to do so. As surely as the truth of Christ is in me, nobody in the regions of Achaia will stop this boasting of mine. Why? Because I do not love you. God knows I do. 
And I will keep on doing what I am doing in order to cut the ground from under those who want an opportunity to be considered equal with us in things they boast about. For such people are false apostles, deceitful workers, masquerading as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It is not surprising then if his servants also masquerade as servants of righteousness. Their end will be what their actions deserve. Wow. So as you start, you're like, that just preaches itself. We can just go home, right? Like just reading it. By the way, that's the best part of the sermon tonight, just reading the word of God. But as you hear it read, and I hope that you're doing this, one of the reasons why we read it is because I hope you're asking yourself questions. Even that initial reading, man, what is Paul talking about? Why is he using this language? Maybe even within yourself, confronting some of the examples and analogies that he's going to use. Because some of them are, are going to feel funky, right? And especially as he's talking about presenting the church as a pure virgin to Christ, we're like, what? And then why does he bring Eve in? Like, how sexist is Paul? Stop. <laughs> I only say those things because you may actually get a little hitch in your giddy-up as he's saying these things. But again, we want to peel back our 21st century sensibilities and get after what Paul is trying to communicate, but because what he is saying is actually something beautiful. He is concerned as a father, a spiritual father for the Corinthians because they are allowing the gospel that he preached to be adulterated by these false, these false apostles and these false teachers. So let's unpack it and get a little better idea of what he's talking about. Starting in verse 1. I hope you will put up with me in a little foolishness. Yes, put up with me. Now, the same thing that Paul said before when he was talking about, please allow me to be bold. And we even said last time, like, no one asks for permission to be bold, right? I mean, not even your kids. Like, hey, can I throw this at my brother? Like, they just don't do that. It's usually done, and then there's an explanation. But Paul is using this as a rhetorical argument. He's setting it up like, hey, I'm going to be foolish in the argumentation that I'm presenting. Here's what I love about Paul. is because he is going to expose through this that it's really the foolishness of the false teachers that he's talking about and the foolishness of the Corinthians that have gone along with this false gospel. He's going to tease that out in such a way where the Corinthians, if they're reading the letter, they're thinking, wait a second. He's talking about us, isn't he? <laughs> Which is, I love because Jesus does that too with his disciples. He walks them into walls. It's my favorite thing when he's talking to the disciples, like when he's saying, hey, all these people, sets up circumstances, all these people need food, don't they? And Jesus is like, they sure do. <laughs> well, we couldn't possibly get this much food. He's like, there's no way, no way to get that done unless it's a miracle. And they're like, yeah. And he's like, go get him food, right? And he sets up these circumstances. That's a new Miller abbreviated translation. But he sets up these circumstances as God so often does that he gives the test before the lesson. Right? He puts us in circumstances where there is a test, and then we learn what the purpose of it was after. And so Paul is going to be pushing a little bit. He's trying to get them to understand what the gospel is about, but he's letting them know right away this is going to seem like foolishness because this is some of the arguments that you're buying, and they're not good. He's going to play the fool here. And, and so this foolishness that he asked them to, to endure is he's going to ask them to consider many things. And, and, and I love the thing that he's going to preach out of here because it's the same thing that he's preached before. It's going to be a weakness, not a strength that God uses. It's going to be a weakness of the individual and the power of the gospel. Because the, the apostles came, and as we said before, these false apostles were everything you would want in a, in a huge megachurch pastor. No offense to megachurch pastors. But, but good-looking, well-spoken, bling-blinging, I mean, everything that you would want in, in this figurehead of leadership except the truth of the gospel. Not saying that megachurch pastors don't have the truth of the gospel, just saying. And so here's, what, here's where he's going to dig in. And when he talks about this foolishness, he's going to talk about the reasons for his foolishness. And the first one right here he's going to start with is that Paul betrothed the Corinthians to Christ, and he, he was jealous when they were endangered. Okay, so look at, look, at verse tw look at verse two. I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. I promised you to one husband, to Christ, so that I might present you as a pure virgin to him. Now, when you hear these words, and this is often a conversation when people say like, man, God is jealous? How, how does that work that God is jealous? Because Paul says that he's jealous in the same way that God is jealous. I'm jealous with a godly jealousy. Now, so often when I think jealous, right, and especially when that word is applied to God, we can get things twisted quick, right, and in a hurry. Because we're like, he's like this overbearing boyfriend, right? And there's this really uncomfortable image because jealousy in our world is so, ugh. Jealousy is usually based, if I'm jealous, it means that you've got something that I want, 
You've got something that I would like to possess. It could be that you're better looking. I wish I was as, be- as good looking as you. You've got like a nicer car than I do. You have a better relationship, but you're jealous of something that someone else has that you yourself want to possess. And so that's gross why. And this is the cool thing about jealousy. Now, it's not cool, but it's a cool understanding of understanding why jealousy is so gross. Because at the core of it, it is an accusation against God. It is God has not given me enough that I should be content. God has given other people things that I should have. I deserve those things or want the things that God has given me. And I am not content, let alone grateful and thankful for what God has provided me. But I want what I don't have. And see, I can just I can go down that trail for a while and make jealousy really gross. But when we feel jealousy cropping up within ourselves, right? When we see, and, and I'm not saying I'm beyond it, and you're probably not either. Someone drives by in a nicer car than you, and you're like, man, I would love. Some guy drove by in one of those new Jeep trucks. Oh, they're so awesome looking. And it was like dark gray. And I'm like, that's really cool. <laughs> Now, it, the cool thing for me is like, I, I hope he, the, my legitimate thought was, I hope he enjoys that car or she or whoever owns that car because I don't want, I, I don't need that car. But jealousy would be like, man, I, I wish I had that car. Instead of saying, God, thank you for the car you provided. God, I am so overjoyed that I've got four wheels and a stick that I can drive around. It's like, that's amazing. God, you have been, do you see the difference? So, so jealousy is gross because it's, it's a sideways accusation against God's goodness. God, you've not provided. As opposed to Paul saying, man, I've learned the secret to being content in all things. Whether I'm living in abundance or whether I've got nothing, whether I'm well, well fed or whether I'm hungry, that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, right? That's out of Philippians. And so the power there is that God has given us the ability to be content knowing that in his sovereign goodness, he has given us all that we need and that should produce in us worship, right? And so jealousy is condemned. It's condemned several places in the Bible, but let's separate human jealousy, which is uber gross, from the jealousy that God displays, And so jealousy that God displays, and we see it most clearly, I think, in Exodus, where it actually says, you shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven or on earth, beneath it or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, is a, am a jealous God. Now, again, you're like, well, wait a second, Eric, that's really gross. It's really gross when it's human jealousy because we're looking, we want things that aren't ours. Here's the thing about God. You're his, okay? Now don't get weird with me, but he owns you. You're his. Everything that he has given you, everything that you have comes from God. So so you are his and he loves you. And so when he says, I'm a jealous God, it's in the context of worship because so often we give our hearts to other things. We worship other things with our time, with our attention, with the affections of our hearts. And God gets jealous because you're mine. I purchased you with the blood of my son, Jesus, out of love. And all I want you to do is love me back. Return the love that I have given you and be faithful to me. And so time and time again in the Old Testament and the New Testament, and boy, if you're reading the English Standard Version, the ESV, which is just fantastic, in the Old Testament, they talk about the nation of Israel as the bride of God, like God's bride. And, that, and then they have all this language makes me really uncomfortable, so I'm gonna get squeamish up here. But the word the ESV uses all the time is whoring. And I'm like, that's in the Bible. And it's probably actually a more accurate translation, but it would talk about Israel as whoring around with other gods. And it just, (laughs) it just makes me uncomfortable. Imagine how God feels. Like, man, you are my people. I gave you life. I gave you spiritual life. I chose you. You are my people. And the people are like, no, we think that Baal's hotter than you. And then they're just whoring with these other gods. (laughs) 
And so godly jealousy is really saying like, no, I, you're mine, You've, you, I'm committed to you, you're committed to me, we're in a covenant relationship where I'm not going anywhere, I'm gonna be completely faithful to you and I want you to be faithful to me. But we get again in the Old Testament as we get this, uh, this analogy specifically displayed in, 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 in books of the Bible, specifically in Hosea. And so if you know the study of Hosea, <laughs> Gomer, uh, basically his wife goes into prostitution and God commands Hosea, the prophet, to go and buy back his own wife from prostitution and to love her. Now, you're looking at me like, oh, it wouldn't be all that bad. Mufasa, like stop, stop yourself for just a second. Like I think you've missed that completely. I want you to imagine being in a committed, loving relationship and your spouse just decides to go and sleep with a bunch of people. And then God says, no, 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 you go grab him. <laughs> you go grab her and you take him back into your house as your spouse. And, and, and so, so now here's what this is, this is why this is so good because if we get real like, oh, that's such a great analogy because that would be horrible. And God's like, that's how you make me feel. That's how you affect my heart when you are not devoted to me. And I've given you far more than any earthly relationship and yet you're willing to, to prostitute yourself to all these things that are less than me. And when you think about it just logically, and I know sometimes it's not a logical thing, but when you think about it logically, like who's better than God? If we were doing like one of those shows where there was God and then he had like three contestants had to pick, you know, like who, who, like who wants to date God? If your answer is anything other than God, you're dumb. Sorry, that's just direct. But how often do we do that? See, that's, that's really the nature of sin is we allow our affections to go places other than God and they will never be satisfied. And so when, when Paul is teasing this idea out, he is functioning again as their spiritual father. And he's saying, basically, I, I committed you. So the church, the Corinthians in this case are like his daughter. He's assuming that spiritual role and he's like, I committed you to this man. I committed you to Jesus. And I want you to be able to, you're betrothed, you're engaged to him. And I love that analogy too. It's so good, the idea of betrothal because we haven't had the consummation yet, right? Like as good as it is to know Jesus in this world, and I hope you know this and I'm not gonna get weird with the theology. If you've never heard this, I'm very sad. <laughs> But there is a great wedding feast coming. Revelation 19, right? Like there's this great, the, the wedding feast of the Lamb where we get to be united with God. And why is marriage a wonderful example and a horrible example? Well, let's start with a horrible example first. Is marriage between human beings is messy, right? And that's a good spot for an amen. Even if you just nod your head, I will accept that. But if you're like, I don't know what you're talking about, preach. My marriage is awesome at all times, daily and nightly and ever so rightly. I you know, like, okay, so then you should lead a marriage conference and start walking on water because that's just not the way that marriage is. Even with the best spouse under the best circumstances, you are still broken, so am I. If Holly was up here, she would be saying amen. <laughs> Okay, so here's the deal. So that's where marriage is, is analogy where we're like, oh man, if my, if my marriage is supposed to represent my relationship with Christ, that's, yeah. Okay, now let me give you the good side. God wants us to have a relationship with him that is intimate beyond anything that we can possibly understand. And so he grabs the most intimate human relationship and says, I wanna compare your most intimate intimate relationship to, your, to the relationship I want with you. And so what we read about in Ephesians 5, and so often we get, we, get, we get into that passage, we're like, well, yeah, right there, women submit, men lead, and we just lay it out. And, like, and we miss, and maybe you've missed this too. I'm not saying you can't derive principles from marriage from Ephesians 5. But here's what we miss in verse 32. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. So even when Paul's talking about marriage, he is giving instruction, but what he's saying is like, the reason I'm describing marriage to you, the reason that I'm talking about this is because we as the church are Christ's bride. And, and I know dudes that just get really uncomfortable with that. <laughs> I don't wanna be wearing a dress. 
Like, stop it. You're, you're following out the analogy far too far. But we're the bride of Christ. And so when you reread Ephesians 5, where it says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with the water through the word to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any, any blemish, but holy and blamed, blameless. Now don't, this is why I said there's, there's ooh and there's awesome. So let's separate the ooh. Because we're like, man, marriage just isn't that way on this earth. Okay, cool. It isn't. But the idea of what marriage is supposed to be times about a billion is what God wants to have with us. And that's gonna make you a little uncomfortable because if you take like your most intimate moment, the most, most powerful connection you've ever had with another human being, which is within the context of marriage, and then you say, God wants that for you and for him. I mean, there's so many times like, like I, I, we, we just sell short what God actually wants for us. We settle for kind of a, a milk toast, lacking in, in, in power relationship with God, where God doesn't want that. He wants to define who we are. He wants to give us life. And, and there's the crazy thing is the God of the universe wants to, to relate to me with a depth of intimacy that can only be closely understood, and it's still at a distance, but can only be even quasi understood by taking a marriage relationship. So you're looking at me funky right now. But this is why this is so good, because if we understand that, then we understand what Paul's desire is. What Paul is saying is that he wants to keep the church pure between their conversion, which is their betrothal to Christ, and their glorification. When we stand before the Lord and we are presented to him as this radiant bride. And this is this process of staying faithful our faith in such a way that after we are saved, we grow in to be that beautiful bride. And I love it. It's one of my favorite, favorite moments when I'm doing wedding ceremonies. And I think I'm up to like a bagillion now. Um, but I, I, I love it because every time, it's been seriously my favorite moment in the ceremony, I'm standing here, dude man standing here, all the people are standing looking nice, smelling sweet, and then we're all waiting for the moment. And most of the time the dude's looking down because he'll say like, tell me when she's, tell me when she's there. And, and when she's walking, and I'm watching, I'm like, oh, man, dude, you don't even know. And, and I'll just lean in. I'm like, this is one of the best moments of your life. And then, and then she gets to the end of the aisle, and he turns and looks. I'm like, dude. And, and literally, and this is, will always be true, I've never seen a bride that isn't beautiful, that just in that moment isn't, isn't gorgeous. And think about all the preparation she has done. Think about all the expense in that moment that she would be clothed in this special dress that she would do something with her hair. And again, you don't have to do any of these things, but in that moment, it's just this beautiful moment. And then if we grab what that means, even just in a small way that God wants to present us to him that way, that we've prepared ourselves and that we're excited in that moment when she's walking down the aisle, I'm like, man, it's Revelation 19. When it's going to be just beautiful, beautiful moments. And if we have that idea of, man, I am preparing, I know Christ, but I'm just I'm preparing by living faithfully because he has loved me so well by returning that love to him. And I know, dudes, I get it. Like, I don't know about, you know, because now you're picturing yourself in like a white wedding dress, all bearded up and nasty. Okay, it's a weird visual if you go there, <laughs> but go with the principle. So Paul is preparing. He's preparing. There's this growth. And, and again, I love the idea of the role of the father. And that's the role that Paul is playing. Is he's, his protection of his daughter is temporary. Why? Because when they get married, and, it's, and, and you're going to think I'm so outdated and like throw chairs at me and like the patriarchy. Okay, you just calm down. Okay, because you're missing a really beautiful moment. And I've, and I've had weddings where people just get all like, mm, no one gives me away. I'm like, okay, calm down, <laughs> calm down. Let me tell you how cool this moment can be. When, when the father walks the daughter down, and I'm, and I'm not thinking about my own daughter, I'll start crying up here. <laughs> but when they have this moment and, and she's walking him down and there's a moment where 
the father takes his daughter's hands and places it in her future husband's hands. And in that moment, there is a transfer, not of ownership. Don't get, you're looking at me right now. You're already angry. Stop, just calm down. I told you this could be cool if we just relax. And in that moment, the father who is, has watched over his daughter has tried to protect and raise her as best as possible is saying, now, son, it is your job to, to give yourself wholly to this woman, to give yourself to her in such a way that she is built up, lifted up, and love her well. And in that moment, I get bubbly. I get misty like there's something in the air. Because I see that, and I'm like, this is, and, I, and I, again, you're looking at me like, that was not my experience at all, Eric. I get it. <laughs> but it can be. And what Paul is doing, can you see Paul walking the Corinthian church down the aisle? <laughs> and then he gets to that moment and Jesus is standing there and then he just, and there's boom. And just puts the church's hands in Christ's hands and presents to him his beautiful bride. Okay. I know I went off on that a little bit, but if you miss the analogy, this seems really weird. If you get it, it is amazingly beautiful. And I hope if you've been hurt by any of the things I just talked about, by yet a bad wedding ceremony or a difficult marriage that, that you can see what God intended it to be. Maybe it's not what you experienced, but this is what it was intended to be, something just ridiculously beautiful. Okay. I know you're thinking, Eric, you're not even on verse three yet. <laughs> ah! <laughs> okay, we're halfway through and I'm on verse three. All right, that we're just setting it up. Now, now we'll go, now we'll go. Verse three, but I am afraid just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. And this is where Paul's jealousy came from. His jealousy was for the Corinthians' fidelity. He wanted them to be faithful. He had a fear and, and he saw it happen. His fear was that they would embrace this false teaching and their understanding of God would be corrupted by these false apostles. Just as Eve was deceived, and again, this is powerful. I gotta say it quick, but if you go back to this section and before you're like, oh, Eric, you're just beating up on women. It's Eve's fault, it's Eve's fault. Stop it. Who was held accountable? Paul, who was right, Paul, who? Adam, who's, you know, Paul's like, excuse me, um, who was held accountable? Adam, who was right there? She ate the apple and gave to a husband just as accountable here. So let's not beat up on women, but here's what it says. What, what was a serpent's lie? And so this is, the, this is so important to understanding why false teaching is so dangerous. Because the serpent called in to question the goodness and the character of God. That's what he said. He said, you will not certainly die. This is Genesis chapter three, verses four and five. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good from evil. Now, this is the same attack that we as Christians have to be aware of is because false teaching will come in. God is, is, is holding out on you. God, God is, is the is ultimate cosmic killjoys. He gave us all these great things and then he said, nope, 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 don't do that. Because it calls into question the integrity of the character of God. And if Satan or any false teacher can get us to call into question the character and the identity of God, you're already sunk. The moment we begin in our deepest souls to doubt God's goodness. I'm not saying there aren't moments in life when things gets really hard and you're like, God, I know you're good, but I don't know how this can possibly be good. I'm not saying that. That's normal and even healthy. If you don't believe me, read Psalms. <laughs> Because they cry out to God, not understanding. So that's not bad. But the moment at our core, we start thinking, God, you're not good. In that moment, we, we are, we're, we're going to fall apart. The wheels are going to come off the wagon. Because if we don't believe in the character and the nature of God revealed in Scripture, we're in trouble. And so that's what, where, where Satan gets Eve to question is the same way false teachers are going to get us to question the character and the integrity of God. Now, the crazy thing here is that when we're tempted in the same way, that nothing can be further from the truth when it comes to the, lo the loving character of God. If God says something's not good, it is 
not good. You can't even do like, not good. Or you can say it like some gusto, right? Because we seriously, sometimes it's good to just call it out. Like, this is not good. When you have a temptation, you're like, legitimately, this is not good. It's not good. And so if we can believe that to be true, then, and one of my favorite quotes from a guy named Matt Chandler is he says, the commands of God are given not to rob me of joy, but to lead me into the fullness of joy. So we can actually believe that, that God has given me things that he says, do this, and it's not meant to, to, to kill my joy, but it's actually meant to lead me into the fullness of joy. And if we can believe that, then what Jesus said is, I've told you these things. And this is from John 15. He said, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. By the way, if you haven't picked up one of the bracelets, we've got a bunch of new ones. This is what we're talking about this year, joy and mission. And just, it's a good reminder. There are times I even look down and I look and it says joy. I'm like, good reminder. I need that. Because God is after our joy. And when we glorify him, the joy that is found in living according to his design is real. And we question that, but I'm telling you, God has not given us commandments to squelch our joy, but to increase our joy. So, okay, we can argue about that later because I can see the look on your face. You're like, not sure about that. All right, we'll argue about it later. Here we go. Now, the second foolishness that Paul is going to be talking about is in verse 4. And he's going to talk about the Corinthians and, and the way that they've given into an, an adulterated gospel. Look at verse 4. For if someone comes to you and preaches a Jesus other than the Jesus we preached, or if you receive a different spirit from the spirit you received, or a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it easily enough. And the idea is he's saying, you guys have been duped. A, a different gospel has been preached and you're like, yeah, that's okay. A, a different spirit has been, re, has been revealed and we'll talk about that in a second. You guys say, okay. A different Jesus and you tolerate this. Now the if is not hypothetical. The if is this is going on. It is happening. It's a rhetorical device to get them to think about it. But these false teachers were preaching a different Jesus. And you got to hear this. If you get Jesus wrong, it doesn't matter what you get right. If you're wrong about Jesus, you are wrong about everything else. And so maybe you're doing all the right things. Maybe, you, maybe you've got a, 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 a life looks like it's pretty good from the outside. But if you've messed up Jesus, you've messed up everything. And so let me, let me just put this in terms that are really important. There are groups out there that call themselves Christian. You're like, oh, Eric, don't pick on people. I gots to, okay? I gots to because otherwise we're going to be deceived. And so let me lovingly, 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 I said it three times, means true. Lo lovingly, I said it four, um, talk about the Mormons, so if you talk with Mormons, and many of us even have Mormon friends, and I have people that I love that are Mormons, and they'll say, I love Jesus. And I'm like, that's awesome. Tell me who Jesus is. And they'll say, well, Jesus was a created being um, that, you know, he's, he's something that the, the, the father, the celestial father had real sex with Mary and then procreated and had this this child named Jesus, and he showed us the way to salvation. He was a, a sister, a, he was, a, he was a, a brother to Lucifer, and Lucifer and Jesus, they, they contended for who is actually going to be the saviors of the world, and that if you follow Jesus and do some good works, then you can become your own God. Now, that's a Mormon doctrine, and it is a completely false gospel. But yet they would claim to love, I would say, I love Jesus, and I, my Mormon friends would say, I love Jesus, and I'm like, okay, is Jesus, a, is Jesus God? They would say, hmm. Well, he, he, he might become a God, Okay, well, how many gods are there? Well, there's one for almost every planet. And you would say, see, that's, that's where you're wrong. You're fundamentally wrong. Jesus is eternally existent. We read at the beginning of, of John chapter one that he has always been. He was with God and he was God. And so, and so to not put Jesus as his everlasting God is, is, to, is to see a different Jesus. The Jehovah's Witnesses teach that Jesus is actually the archangel Michael. You're wrong. And, and I, I know that's like, well, we live in a, a time and a day and age where you're like, you can't tell people they're wrong. 
Oh, baby. I, and, and literally, I, if you are not compelled by Scripture to lovingly tell people the truth, let me encourage you to be more like Paul. If someone comes to you, and this is exactly what he says, it's so scary in Galatians, where he says if someone comes to you, even if it's an angel and preaches a different gospel than the one that we have preached, let them be eternally condemned. Like, whoa. You saying false teachers should, you're, you're eternally condemned is like, go to hell. Like, yeah. And, and prayerfully they will repent, but if they don't, they are leading people astray. And whenever you put any kind of unnecessary barrier between Jesus and a person, you are in trouble with God. And that's what these false teachers are doing. And, and so many times we get in our culture like, oh, I don't want to get into theology too much. Uh, doctrine. Uh, don't, uh, just tell me about Jesus. Don't get into too much of that doctrine stuff. Oh, my. It's like saying, don't make me super strong. I just want to be anemic and weak. No, 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 I, I'll just lay here. No, don't, don't, no, no, just, just throw food at my mouth. That would be great. You play a game, it's like horseshoes. I'll leave my mouth open. Stop. <laughs> we are meant to grow and mature. And the reason why theology, the reason why doctrine is so important is that if you don't know it, you're gonna get duped by bad teaching. That's why Jesus, why Jesus this is why Paul says to Timothy, watch your life and your doctrine because All right. You be saved, but your hearers will be saved by it as well. Doctrine and theology, knowledge, of, if you don't like those words, knowledge of God. Theology, theo, meaning God, ology, the study of, means study, right? So I myself, I'm a holiologist because I study my wife. <laughs> That's not scary. <laughs> it's not scary, it's just what it is. And because I love and care about her, I want to study her. The same thing is true of God, theology, study God. And here's what theology is for. Theology is for our enjoyment. I hope you know that in your soul. Like we study God because the more we know about God, the more amazing he is. It is for our enjoyment. God doesn't need to reveal himself, but he did. Amen. <laughs> right, okay? So, and, and so, so here's the problem. In 2 Timothy, in a verse that you've heard before, Paul says, here's the problem. A time will come where people will not put up with sound what? Doctrine but instead they will gather around a bunch of teachers that will tell them what their itching ears want to hear. My friends, my friends, this is that time. <laughs> this is that time. The, the, the amount of bad theology that is propagated by the internet is crazy. <laughs> like literally, and I, I enjoy it because my brain's just wired that way, but I just, I just scroll through Facebook, I'm like, heresy, 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 good stuff. Heresy, 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 heresy. But we live in such an environment where so many times we don't even know why something is wrong. But the more we draw close to God, the more we understand him. This is why theology and doctrine are so important. They matter because they reveal who God is. And these people were putting up with it easy enough. They were allowing this heresy to exist. Now, Paul is going to be foolish one more time, and he's going to compare himself to the super apostles. Why is this foolishness? because he's gonna compare himself by their standards, which he's already, if you've been here, he's already like, I don't need to prove anything to you guys. But he's gonna compare, foolishly, himself to these super apostles. Look at verse five. I do not think I am in the least inferior to these super imposters. Wow, these super apostles. Imposters is an appropriate word, but not the one that Paul used. Now this is a word that Paul made up. There's not evidence of this being anywhere else. There's one more time in chapter 12 where he uses this word again, but it's, it's, not, it's not nice. <laughs> it's, it's in quotations because the, the, the translators want you to know that he's not saying, these are super apostles. Like this is not, you know, Marvel chapter two. Like this is, this, these are not superheroes. These are people that have an overinflated estimation of themselves based on nothing but their own criteria. And that's what we talked about last week but he's going to compare himself to them. And what I love about this is that Paul doesn't back down from anybody. Like even the legitimate first round apostles, he's like, here's the deal. I, and he, he's humble, but what does he say? He says, By the grace of, he says that um, for I am the least of the apostles and not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. 
Right? I, I love this idea that he was humble about it. He didn't say he was an apostle, but he knew that man, like, I, I don't deserve what I've been given. He, he calls himself an apostle that was abnormally born. Why is that? Because he didn't see Jesus in the flesh. He had to wait till after Jesus was dead, crucified, and resurrected before Jesus met him on the road to Damascus. So his story isn't even like the rest of them. But then, and I love this, but then he goes in, in Galatia, like uh, the, the main dudes come and talk to him, what he calls the pillars, right? And so Peter is there, James is there, and John is there. Now, I don't know about you, but if Peter, James, and John, if Peters came up and started talking theology, I'd be like, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I would, I would defer so hard and suck into myself and my insecurities that I would just cease to exist. Big, bing, and I'd be gone. But, but, but Paul is like, oh, I opposed Peter to his face. This is Peter, walk on water, Peter, right? This is the dude, the heavy, when it came to the apostles. And he's like, no, I told him it was up. He was acting like a legalist. He was going back to being Jewish and I smacked him in the face. No, he didn't smack him in the face. But he opposed him to his face. So Paul is not afraid to go toe to toe. He is humble, but he's assertive when he needs to be. And so he talks about these guys. He says, I'm not inferior to these guys. I'm not inferior to these super apostles. You think they're awesome. They think they're awesome. But I know who God has made me to be. Now look at verse six. I may indeed be untrained as a speaker, but I do have knowledge. We have made this perfectly clear to you in every way. Now this idea of an untrained speaker is he was not trained in the same way in rhetoric. Now, Paul is smarter than anyone in this room, no offense. <laughs> Paul had probably large sections, if not the entire Pentateuch, first five books of the Bible memorized. It's what the Pharisees did. I want you to go home and try to memorize just a chapter of Genesis tonight. Okay, now imagine Leviticus and just, just quoting that, okay? Paul's, so again, you're like, I'm smarter than that. Okay, then you're awesome. I'm not, I'll just say me. I shouldn't say you, I'm sorry to drag you into this. But I'm not as smart as Paul. And for Paul to be like, dude, here's the deal. I'm not, I'm not skilled in the way that you think is important. And this is so good. But I do have knowledge. Man, I hope you're applying that to yourself. Because there are times where like people that are wicked smart in the ways of this world to be like, oh yeah, I'm gonna disprove your Jesus. I'm like, hey, I may not be trained in astrophysics, but I do have knowledge. Like I may not be trained in quantum mathematics. I may not be trained, like you're gonna defeat me when it comes to like participle agreement and a gerund, which is an English term of some kind. You're going to totally defeat me there. But I do have knowledge. And I love that. He's like, dude, you can bring all the smart in the world. You, you may have an alphabet soup behind your name, Mr. PhD, MDiv, whatever you've got but I'm not intimidated by you because I've got knowledge. I know that I know Jesus. I know that I know his word and, and I'm going to respectfully, but directly, especially because they are adulterating and manipulating the gospel, which is the means of salvation for the Corinthians. I'm gonna be up in your business because you can't treat my bride, <laughs> my people like that. I'm preparing her for the king. You can't treat her that way. I'm not gonna have her misled. I'm not gonna have her deceived. See, is where we get into that marriage analogy earlier where you felt really uncomfortable. Okay, so here's the deal. And it continues in verse six. I may indeed be an untrained speaker and I just get the end part of this. We have made this perfectly clear to you. And so they have seen time and time again that Paul has, has been able to expose them and teach them about the very things of God. Now look at verse seven. Was it sin for me to lower myself in order to elevate you by preaching the gospel of God to you free of charge? I robbed the other churches by receiving support from them so as to serve you. Now that sounds really weird. Here's the thing that you need to know that the, the, the super apostles believed that their teaching was worthy of payment. And so when Jesus, and when Paul, wow, I'm getting my names mixed up. When Paul didn't take payment, they used that as a knock against him. Well, your teaching isn't even worth money. Are you kidding me? Like we make money off of this because we are so amazing and you're not even making money. And here they, they can even use Paul against Paul because Paul says a worker's worth his wages that you should actually pay people that are preaching the gospel and he's not taking money so what does that mean? 
And so the way he puts this, and he's so, so snarky. <laughs> like, I just love it. Because he, he just, the, the way he says it, the, the way he used these words, like, was it a sin for me to lower myself? Obviously, no. Because what was his point? I lowered myself in order to elevate you to preach the word. Was it a sin for me to be humble? And so anybody that knows anything about God would be like, no, it's not. And so by that time, he's already got you. So you give Paul an inch and he's going to build something on it. And so he does that. He's like, oh, I got you. Well, let's keep going then. I, I robbed other churches. <laughs> and even that expression, robbed? He's talking about, and we'll see in a second, the, the, the support that he received from the Macedonian churches. Now, why did he take that? Because for the Corinthians, if he took money, it would be something that could be used against them and it could impugn the integrity of the gospel. Paul took money. He was not opposed to taking money. In fact, he, he was supplied amply well. And the gospel, it, it needs to go forward and that, that involves money. But he, whenever he would go to a place where taking money would, would, would distort or in some way affect the integrity of the gospel, he wouldn't take it. And so he didn't take money from these guys. And, and it's awesome because we've already seen, what did he say about these false, these false teachers? That they literally, and this is 2 Corinthians 2.17, um, that he said, we do not peddle the word of God for profit. We're not pimping the gospel to make money. And I just, it's so good. It just sticks it, right? And we, it went back when we talked about that too, and we were talking about, you know, prosperity gospel guys, the guy like Deal and Doug that has like all the bling bling. You guys, Deal and Doug, anybody? Colorado for long enough? But all like the, the on the fingers, you get the gold. And when you see those dudes, literally, there's a prosperity gospel who's a preacher whose last name is Dollar. I'm like, he's kind of letting you know. <laughs> Dude's got a net worth of like $128 million. And the son of man had no place to rest his head. Like if you're getting rich off the gospel, something is broken. And, and so Paul said, I, I don't even want money to be the issue. And if that means me not taking support and me working as a tent maker, so I don't have to take support for you, so you cannot accuse the gospel that I am preaching of a lack of integrity, then I'm not taking money. I love it. Now look at verse, verse nine. And when I was with you and needed something, I, did not burden, I was not a burden to anyone for the brothers who came from Macedonia supplied what I needed. I have kept myself from being a burden to you in any way and I will continue to do so. And we know again, if you read in Acts chapter 18, when Paul, when Paul first came to Corinth, we read about all of this. We read about how he came, what he did when he was there in terms of working, and then ultimately that he received money from Philippi and probably Thessalonica that was delivered to him when Timothy and, uh, when, when Timothy and, Titus, or Timothy and Silas arrived. Now look at verse 10. And surely as the truth of Christ is in me, nobody in the region of Achaia will stop, boast, will stop this boasting of mine. Why? Because I do not love you. God knows I do. And so his boast is that he preached the gospel for free. Achaia is the region that Corinth is in. So he's like, nobody in Larimer County is gonna prevent me from boasting. That's basically what he's saying. He's boasting that he preached the gospel for free. And then he says, because I don't love you? He, he said, the, 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 the knock against him would have been like, they didn't, you know, I didn't take money because I didn't actually want you. I, didn't, I, didn't, I don't love you, so I'm not taking your resources. He's like, no, you know that's not true. You know that that's not true. I live with you for a long time. I preach the gospel because I love you. Okay, let's finish it up. A few more verses here. Verse 12. And I will keep on doing what I am doing in order to cut the ground from under those who want an opportunity to be considered equal with us in the things they boast about. Come on. I know, I know, I know we've been going at it for a while, but if you don't stop and just appreciate that moment, I'm going to keep doing it. You want me to stop doing this? I'm going to do it even harder. Mm -hmm. I love it. This is why you gotta fall in love with Paul because of what he's saying. Man, I'm gonna keep on doing this, but look at his motivation because I'm gonna take all the ground those false teachers are camping out on. I am going to undercut anything that they are doing so you know that they are not equal with us. 
They're not equal with the apostles. They're not equal with the people that are preaching the true word of God. Don't trust them. And I love that he throws back in their face that his financial independence highlights their financial dependence. Did you get that? Like, I didn't take money, but they did. And if I didn't take money because I wanted to make sure that the gospel is, 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 is seen as being full of integrity, then what is their gospel? If they're pimping their gospel for money, then what does that make them? So he's casting this biblically accurate net so that the people would be able to see that these people are exactly what it says in verse 17. For such people are false apostles, deceitful workers, masquerading as an apostle of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It is not surprising then if his servants also masquerade as servants of righteousness. Their end will be what their actions deserve. Dun, dun, dun. So Paul went full Paul here. <laughs> like this is full Paul. Because he, I mean, you, you were with us in chapter 10. He was walking through and there was a little bit of like, okay, they're, they're bad, they're wrong. But now he's like, don't miss the point here. Don't follow these men. They're charlatans. They're, they're masquerading as righteous men, but they are not. And you're like, whoa, that's really hard. Why, man, Jesus would never say anything like that to anyone. John 8, 44 of the Pharisees. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He is a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native tongue, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Wow. See, whenever we want to make Jesus Mr. Rogers, I beg you to read the scriptures. I beg you to read the scriptures. We have this watered down, milk toast, mealy mouth version of Jesus that is nothing of what he truly was. Jesus' heart is gentle and lowly. He is an amazing God full of compassion and love and life. But if you mess with people, if you try to convince them of things that are not true of God, he will put you on blast. The Pharisees got some of the, the, I mean, they called them whitewashed tombs, a right? like brood of vipers. Like, oh, my Jesus would never say anything about that. Like, maybe your Jesus isn't Jesus, Jesus, right? And, and so Paul is following in this tradition. Again, he, these, these men are affecting the people of God. And so we always want to be loving, but we cannot take away from the truth. If someone is teaching a different gospel than the gospel that's been revealed in the word of God, that person needs to be addressed. And we can debate other secondary issues, but if you mess with the gospel, there needs to be a little bit of verbal throwdown, right? If you hear me distort the, if you don't charge the stage, I'm gonna be disappointed. Like seriously, if I start getting up here and saying some crazy humpity bumpity about who Jesus is, like yeah, Jesus was, you know, he was, if any of the things we talked about, you know, Jesus, well, you know, he, he's not actually the son of God. He's, you know, like, come and tackle me and go low because if you go high, I'll probably stop you. But if you go at the knee sideways, I'll, I'll go, it'll be Joe Theismann all over again. So do you know who that? Okay, anyway, thank you. Thank you, you do. Ugh. Okay, so here's the deal. Don't miss this, and I know we're running out of time here, but in this section, I want you to hear not only, and this is where we don't, this is why I spent so long on that marriage part at the beginning. How, how amazing is God? That he wants to love us that way? I don't even love me that way. That he wants to know me and be known that way? That, that all the things that we would love for marriage to be, even if our marriages are awesome, <laughs> all the things we would love for marriage to be as God designed it, Jesus is. And when we allow him to be who he says he is in our lives, man, that is what we were designed to do, to relate to God in a way where just to know him is the thing that, that gives me life. All these other blessings are amazing, but to know Jesus, sometimes you hear people talk about heaven and it's like they're talking about going to Disneyland. I'm like, hey, Disneyland is awesome, 
But the thing that's going to make heaven awesome is Jesus. It's not the new body. <laughs> it's not the, the no more sin. All those things are awesome. But they're secondary to being in the presence of Jesus himself. Like, there's, there's not even a need for the sun because the, the glory of God, the glory of Jesus, will, will they say, that's the light. Are you kidding me? I don't even know what that means. <laughs> but that's the goal. And so anybody that would mess with our connection to Jesus has to be talked to. And not, not beat up. I mean, I joked about that stuff. Not, not beat up, but like you, if you're going to distort the gospel, you're messing with God and you're messing with God's people. So it has to be talked about. And so I hope that even as you're talking with people and they say, I love Jesus, ask them what that means. And then, and then ever so gently, just refer them back to the word of God because our Jesus is better than any other Jesus out there. Like when you talk to a Mormon, I'm like, oh buddy, it's so much better than you can imagine. <laughs> Respectfully, our Jesus, the Jesus of the word of God is the only and the best Jesus. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for your truth. Thank you for your word. Thank you for an opportunity as we hear your word to be drawn into a deeper relationship with you. Father, I thank you that you have given us the only gift that truly matters in this lifetime. And that is knowledge of your son, Jesus, and that by faith we can be forgiven. And so, Father, in times where we may have walked far from you, times where we may have challenged in our own hearts whether we truly believe you are good. I pray that you would shore up our knowledge of you by letting us see how awesome you are through your word. Father, as we see and behold your beauty, your mercy, your compassion, your holiness, I pray that those things would transform our lives that it would be out of great joy that we would follow you, that it would be out of great love that we would draw close and that we would serve you as we serve those around us and that in all ways, the name of Jesus, the name that is above all names, the name at which every knee will bow and every tongue will confess, that the, the name of Jesus that would be the, the desire of our hearts, to know you and to make you known, for you are worthy. God, thank you for your word and thank you for your, the chance to hear from you tonight. We pray your blessing upon us as we go. May we walk closely with you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.